Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. This one is number 13 in our series on the love of God. Now, many Christian denominations believe that God's love is unconditional, and it doesn't matter what you do. Amen. The more you understand, He's loved us with an unconditional love. He's loved us with an unstoppable love. Nothing can stop His love towards you. He's loved us with an everlasting love. His love will never stop. It'll never cease. He will love you for all eternity, all of time and all of eternity, because He doesn't love you based on your performance. God does not give you a little bit of love, a little bit more love. Oh, you performed well, here's a bit more love. And, and the way that we walk in that love is when we look at Jesus, when we look to Jesus and Christ fills our heart. Because when Christ fills our heart, that is when we understand how much God has loved us. He has loved us in fullness. That just blows my mind. God loves me in fullness. There is nothing that he has held back in his love towards me. I can't get him to love me anymore, and I can't get him to love me any less. He loves me in absolute fullness. Well, before we get into the Gospels concerning the love of God, let's come back to the book of Psalms first, Psalm 145. And let's see here in the Old Testament that it is conditional, and we will see in the New Testament it is conditional. Now, let's just use a little example before we come to Psalm 145. If two people love each other, husband and wife, they work together, they cooperate together, and they obey God. What destroys a marriage? when the commitment and covenant to be faithful is violated. That's called adultery. And there are many forms of it, including pornography. What's another one? Lying. What's another one? Being mean, abusive. All of those drive away love. Because you see, love is conditional, always is. God's love is everlasting, but he doesn't give his love to everyone unconditionally. Because just like with a married husband and wife, they have to love each other, agree with each other, be faithful to each other, trust each other. And all of those things, then you can have a happy, loving marriage, loving one another, knowing securely that everything is right and good and lawful. Now, marriage involves the mind, the emotions, the body, the work, the dedication, the thoughts so that a marriage will work, and male and female, husband and wife, become one flesh that way. Now, here in Psalm 145, we're going to read what God does, how he works with us. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down, that is, if they turn to God. The eyes of all wait upon you. You give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Now, that's an expression of God's love for everyone, regardless of their behavior. Verse 17, 
The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving in all his works. Now notice verse 18. The Lord is near unto all who call upon him, unto all who call upon him in truth. Now let's analyze this just a little bit because there are a lot of people out there who believe in Jesus. But do they call upon him in truth? What is truth? The word of God is truth. The commandments of God are truth. The Holy Spirit of God is truth. God himself is truth. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Can you worship God if you're not doing it in truth? If you really don't mean it? If you come to God and ask him to sanction your sins, whatever that is, and sin is a transgression of the law, so if you want to know what all that entails, read the Ten Commandments. And think on this for a little bit. Can you get a pseudo-love if you do some of the things that God says? But will God sanction and bless a day he never said to keep holy? And you come to God and ask him to bless it? Try that on for Sunday. I'll just let you think on that. So this tells us then, if you don't call upon God in truth, he's not near you. And the wicked are far off from the Lord. Look at how the atheists treat Christians today. Any kind of Christianity they hate and despise, while well, they're hating and despising God. Here the whole creation is out there to show that God has created everything and yet they're so ignorant and presumptuous and hostile to God that they, they demand that everyone <laughs> believes in their evolution. God is far off from them. Notice verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of those that fear him. Now, what does that say about those who don't fear him? Think about that for a little bit. He also will hear their cry and will save them. You want God to intervene in your life? You want God to hear your prayers? Well, you call upon him in truth. That's why confession of all sin is not to a priest in a little cupboard box but to God directly, because God knows the heart. Let's go on. Notice verse 20. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. Now let's take that last verse and let's apply it to where we left off last time with Matthew 24. Why is the world getting increasingly mean, hostile, desperate, with so many things going on, as Jesus said they would go on? And why can't people get along? Oh, because they've told God to go away. They've told God, we don't want you in government, we don't want you in the schools, we don't want you in the families, we don't want you in the city councils, we don't want you in the legislators. We want our way. Oh, but by the way, ask God to bless us. How's that working? Now let's read it right here, verse 12. Because lawlessness shall be multiplied, the love of many shall grow cold. That tells you why there's no love in the society, or very little. Lawlessness. There are different kinds of lawlessness. Lawlessness is without law altogether, totally lawless. Lawlessness is knowing what the law is, but violating the law, which is what is happening around the world in every government and here in the United States from the White House on down to the state legislatures and everything. There are some few trying to do what's right. But look at how they're overwhelmed. 
Look at how they are pushed down upon by those who want their own godless, defiant agenda. That's why the love of many shall grow cold. And you expect God to love people who do that? So if you want the love of God in your life, there are some things you're going to have to do. Now let's come back here to Luke 11. Now there is a pseudo love, as we will see. And a pseudo love is a fake love. And what kind of love is that? That is a love that everybody in your little group, you accept. You hate others of. Now, let's look at this from the point of view as taught by Christ to the religious leaders of his day. Now, the ones who should have known who he was were the religious leaders. They had the prophecies. They had the word of God. And what happens with religious leaders when they become the establishment? while they take upon themselves to do many evil and hateful things. Let's see what the problem was with the scribes and the Pharisees and the doctors of the law. Let's pick it up here, Luke 11, verse 37. Now, while he was speaking, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down. But the Pharisee, seeing this, wondered why he had not first washed before dinner. Now, you can go to Mark, the seventh chapter, and you can read the washing of hands and pots and cups and tables and everything like this. They're traditional laws, just like it is today. The Jews then had their traditional laws that they established through their establishment religion, which was not the religion of Moses, and was not in accordance with the laws of God. Jesus said that through following the traditions of the elders, they were rejecting the commandments of God. And we're going to see the greatest commandment is loving God, and we're going to see that's where they failed greatly. Then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greediness and wickedness. Fools, did not he who made the outside also make the inside? Rather give alms of the things that are within, and behold, all things are clean to you. Now what does that mean? That means that you have pure motives, a pure heart, because you love God. They had a religion but they didn't love God. How many people today have a religion, but they don't know how to love God? And how about loving your neighbor? Look at the Muslim religion, filled with hate, murder, blood, and death. Look what has happened to every religion, even Christian religion on the earth because lawlessness has multiplied, they're all coming down. Now notice, verse 42, here's what happens. But woe to you Pharisees, you pay tithes of mint and rue and every herb, but you pass over the judgment and the love of God. Let's say a, a not too distant past situation with Jimmy Jones and Guyana. The victims then had several minutes to wait until the poison took effect. Time enough for families to get together and then to lie down together, to die together, and for children... To Jonestown, Guyana was the most horrific example of cult death. 900 followers of Jim Jones committed suicide or were murdered. There were old people among the dead too. One of them a man of 108. Experts on death rituals have found that 20th century mass cult sacrifices are linked to burial practices that began over 5,000 years ago and have been occurring in one form or another ever since. 
It's a phenomenon that actually occurs throughout the world. Every continent effectively has an example. Yet they started out just supposedly fine. But they never kept the laws of God, the commandments of God, so they didn't love God. That's the key. Pass over judgment, you're partial, you're not fair. And pass over the love of God. Now, the love of God is the most important thing. So how can you say you represent God when you don't have the love of God? And how can you say you love God if you don't believe him and obey him? And remember how many times have we covered the simplest way to define what God wants is this, obey his voice. And we have it all in print now, what we need to do. Now notice, it is obligatory for you to do these things and not to set aside those lesser things. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seat in the synagogues and the salutations in the marketplaces. Yes, power, position, recognition, rather than humble service to God the way that it should be. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, a hypocrite here means a sanctimonious pretender. You're pretending that you are righteous, but your thoughts are not. You are pretending that you love people, but you want power and acclaim. That's not loving God. What did we read? God is far from the wicked. How close is God to you? Let's read on. Woe well, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are as unseen tombs, and men who walk over them do not know it. Now, Jesus, in bringing this correction to them, was showing the love of God, because God chastens everyone so that we may repent. So when we repent, then we can be restored to the love of God. If we don't repent, there is no love of God, just like Jesus brought out. Now, let's go on, because this is a central focal point in the New Testament about religious leaders who knew nothing of the love of God, about those who loved power, who loved position, who ruled over the people, who told them what to do, and they didn't do it themselves. Now, notice what happened. And one of the doctors of the law answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you are also insulting us, us dignified. We know everything. We are the elite of the elite, the cream de la cream. Yes, we are the top rung in the society, the elite who know everything and look down upon these scroungy masses as rubble. Same thing today. Yes, indeed. Notice Jesus' answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you. No. <laughs> Verse 46, and he said, Woe to you also, doctors of the law, for you weigh men down with burdens heavy to bear, but you yourselves will not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Yes, an open political show just to be seen. Everybody bow down and look at your religious dress and you love the praise, Rabbi or Father. And Jesus said, call no man Father on the earth in a religious sense or whatever title. Verse 47, woe to you doctors of the law for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. Therefore, you are bearing witness and consenting to the works of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build the tombs. 
Because of this, the wisdom of God also says, I will send prophets and apostles to them, and some of them they shall kill, and others they shall drive out, so that the blood of all the prophets poured out from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, who perished between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be required of this generation. Question, what do you think is going to be required of this generation? Well, you need to understand the prophecies. It's going to be terrible. It is going to be, as Jesus said, the worst time in the world that has ever been from the creation. So what we need to do is draw close to God. We need to love God. We need God to love us. And one of the greatest sins of the doctors of the law is that they kept people from understanding the truth. And they themselves kept their own traditions, just like the Protestants and Catholics and Jews today and the Muslims and the Hindus and the Orthodox and any religion you want to look at, they all fit into this category here. Notice, verse 52, Woe unto you, doctors of the law, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you prevent those who were entering. Now, let's put that in terms of things today. You find out about the Sabbath that you should keep it. You immediately run to your Sunday-keeping minister and say, Oh, I've discovered that the Sabbath is what God wants. It's actually the fourth commandment. And the Catholics, as we have seen, are so bold as to remove the second commandment and call the Sabbath commandment the third commandment. So you run to the priest and say, oh, it says we're to keep the Sabbath. Oh, don't worry about that. No, you don't have to do that. Jesus did away with the law, or that belongs to the old law. Well, that's not true. You get our booklet, a Sabbath Sunday controversy you have never read, written by a Catholic, pointing out to the Protestants how wrong you are, Protestants, in saying that you can find Sunday keeping in the New Testament, and he goes to every one of the scriptures and shows there is no authorization of Sunday keeping in the New Testament. So how then, question, can you love God with Sunday keeping when Jesus said, if you love me, keep the commandments, namely my commandments. And remember, he was the Lord God of the Old Testament. Think on that. Now let's come to John, the fifth chapter. The scribes and Pharisees looked upon John the Baptist in different ways. He was a burning light, but they didn't go to him. And he explains why. Verse 37, And the Father himself has sent me, and is borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice nor seen his form at any time. No one has, only Jesus this is another proof that he was Lord God of the Old Testament. Now notice verse 38. Here is the key. Here is part of the building of the love of God. You can't have an emotional feeling like you're just falling in love with a person and you're attracted to that person, okay? That's not the kind of love we're talking about here. But this becomes a very important key. Verse 38, And you do not have his word dwelling in you. Now, what does that mean? That means to have the word of God in your mind, in your heart. You live by it. You think by it. You view everything in life through the word of God. You do not have 
the love of God dwelling in you, Jesus told these religious leaders. Is it any wonder that today their descendants have created a lawless world? Mark this, every problem in the world or nation or city or state or province in which you live is generated because people do not keep the commandments of God and they do not love God. That is lawlessness multiplied. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have doing away with the law and loving God. You must come to God on his terms. God says to the wicked, forsake your ways, forsake your thoughts, and come to me and have my ways and my thoughts and my word dwelling in you, living in you, so that you can have the love of God. Now, in this world, we have all of these obstacles to go against. Now, we have an extended series of love that's available on cbcg.org. You can either download it there or you can email us and we'll send it to you. It also has all the transcripts for the more than 20 sermons covering the love of God. That's how important it is. It is everything that God bases his whole creation, his behavior, and his relationship with those who are his, based on the love of God. And so when you look in the world today and you try and figure out what on earth is going on, what is the world coming to, and that's because they've rejected God. So you write in for the series, The Love of God, we have many, many other sermons on cbcg.org. We have a lot of material you can download on the homepage of Church at Home. So until next time, this is Fred Coulter saying thank you for inviting me into your home and so long till next time.